So this is maybe UX 101? No. This is worldwide fast wind tour of what you have available to you in the lab. If you want to go so deeper, <laughs> yeah, if you want to go deeper, come to that HCI 570 class. Um, we're going to go deeper into a lot of these. Why was that selected for Saturday? Um, because we're trying to get a lot of industry reps there. Oh, uh, I was really disappointed because my September Saturdays are pretty well booked. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, just uh, what I would do is I would let... Um, if you're still interested in it, just let Stephen know. Because mm -hmm. then... you're going to videotape them, right? Yeah, we haven't decided how we're going to package it for asynchronous students, um, but we will videotape, yeah. Okay. So, okay. Um, yeah, yeah. So, um, and I think, I mean, we may offer it. It may morph into like an actual course or whatever. Kind of just, nice. you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, welcome. So some of you guys are new faces. Some of you I know. Um, so just to give kind of general background, where are you guys coming from? If you were to claim a discipline or what's your, who are your people? So I'm under uh, Elite and Gimp. Yeah, but who do you, like, oh. where's your discipline? <laughs> like if you were to say, I am a, what would it be? <laughs> Computer scientist. All right, there we go. Okay, all right, what about other folks? I'm mechanical and Biology. Ooh, you're a weird one. All right. Uh, technology. Yeah. yeah. More design. <laughs> okay. Design. Okay. And Hannah, what do you claim? Both? Uh, I'm an interaction designer. I know. I like it. Okay. Um, well, this is a lab. So the purpose of today is I'm going to go through, uh, I'm trying to leave some time just so you guys can ask questions about the tools. This is going to be a worldwide or whirlwind tour of what's possible in the lab and what you guys can use in here. Um, and I'm hoping, normally, the process for the lab. Uh, is I try to take a really hands-on approach because I find that most people in our program don't really know how to do the various tools and techniques in UX. And so um, the first thing to know is, actually, Hannah, do you want to bring up the um, Usability Lab uh, website? Mm -hmm. So it's really easy. It's isuhciuxlab.com, um, which is completely illegal, and it'll redirect you into the URAC world. But anyway, that's what it is. Um, isuhciuxlab.com. Oh, um, so if you ever want to use the lab, if you want just a question, if you have anything, I'm going to ask that you use that book, the lab, right there. Um, and so this will allow you to, even if you just have a question, um, or if you want to, even if you're not going to use the space and you're just going to, like Bethany, for instance, she's going to use digital recorders for some of her usability testing, you can do that. We also have, I tried to make the lab as modular as possible, so we have some checkout laptops that we can load Moray on, so you can actually do a field study. Um, we have webcams, we have Gorillapods for the mini cams. we're going to have a series of iPads, we're going to have a series of smartphones, there are smart pins in here, so there's lots of stuff that can like walk out of this room um, that you can book and you can use. There's also online software um, that you can use. A lot of our remote students use it for usability testing, which I'll show you. So all of that stuff you can book all through there. Um, you just you just add the note in the description. Also, the days on there um, are not. Um, we had to get the widget in WordPress because it was the only free one where it's a whole day. So even if you see a day red, it could mean that something's still available. So still go ahead and try to book, and then um, I try to respond to everybody within 24 hours for that. So. Um, normally what happens after you book the lab, then we'll come in, we'll have a conversation about what do you want to do, and I'll help you with whatever I can in terms of which tools or techniques. A lot of times we could also have a question about kind of your research methods and what's appropriate, how do you set up the experiment, how do you triangulate, um, you know, in order to get the most data possible around a particular research question, and so I can help with all of that. Uh, there's also books up there. We have a library part of the UX lab, and you can see on the lab website, you'll be able to see all the books that we do have. Um, we have a little delicious, uh, there you go, isn't that cool? Yeah, that took a lot of time. Um, so you can see all the books there uh, and what we have available for you to check out. So that's all the resources that are available. So basically the moral of that story is book the lab. Um, and, and it's also, it is a shameless plug, but the more that we use the lab as a community, the more I can um, beg for funding uh, and, you know. <laughs> Get more. So right now I'm going to introduce you to the three core members of the UX uh, lab team and that is PARC. So you're going to learn through your studies if you haven't already about Xerox PARC which is uh, fundamental in terms of theory shaping of our field. So we have labeled this guy PARC. Um, this guy, or girl actually is Sushman, 
um, or Sushman, depending if you're English or not. Anyway, and that's for um, Lucy Sushman, who uh, she's also contributed a great deal into our field, um, specifically in the way of socioethnographic kind of studies. So this is Sushman. And then that's Carol. And Carol, uh, you guys shall know that up here in 591, <laughs> Carol is the Models, Methods, and Frameworks guy, and so that is Carol. Um, no Norin and Nardi are waiting in the pipeline for as soon as we get two more. Supply and demand. Um, so anyway, so those are the, the, the key members of the lab. Um, all of them are dual boot um, in terms of they have both uh, Windows and Mac, and so whatever applications you need, um, we have both platforms. Sorry, if you're a Linux. Sorry. Um, we don't have that. Uh, and there's different software that can operate on both sides or just on one, depending on what you're needing. Okay, so let's get into the brass tacks. So let's say that, how many of you are, what are kind of research projects that you guys are working on right now? Boeing. Medical. Medical, that's right, okay. Which one? The 3D vision. ASDS is the conceptual design. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, okay, got it, okay, all right. I'm not thesis, I don't have research. Oh, okay, so what are you interested in? Um, the biorenewables. Okay, and so why are you in HCI? Um, because somebody has to make all the, the fun stuff that goes with it, too. And I like all the tech that goes with that stuff, so. So when you're saying tech, are you talking software? Yeah. Okay, all right, so you want to actually make something that other biologists might actually use. Correct. Okay, so that you're not wasting your time. Right. Okay. That's good, <laughs> all right. I'm doing the multi-view in the LVC. It's a virtual environment. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Not yet. <laughs> Not yet? What are you interested in? You said web design, right? Yeah, I'm more into interaction design, user experience, that kind of stuff. Okay. All right. So um, I don't want to go too far into the... Sorry, Hannah, do you want to share? Uh, yeah, we actually have two oh, okay. online students, okay. possibly, if they it's can like Michael, hear me. Maybe. Bradley and Paige. Uh, okay. I'm not sure if... I don't know if Bradley is here. here. So this is always really interesting um, in <laughs> this merging online, so, yeah. online on continue. campus. Yeah, we don't have a good model for this yet. So anybody interested in that line of research, I think you would think about mine. Um, okay, so let's say that you want to make something, whether it is a product or if it's software or if it's even in a 3D environment, right? Um, the general process from an HCI perspective is that you would do some kind of needs assessment with your users, you do some kind of prototyping, you test it, validate with users, you throw a couple things at them, right, actually measure it in behavior, then you'd maybe develop a little bit, and then you try it again, test with them, develop a little bit, test with them again, develop a little bit, right, and take this iterative approach. That's a general process of HCI. So the stuff I'm gonna say to, to talk about today, it is largely for computer-based systems, but I think all of the concepts apply to more of the three-dimensional type things that you might be doing, okay? Um, so the first one is normally we would start with some kind of low fidelity prototyping. So this is an example of a paper prototype. Um, Jose Camus actually got employed. Actually, Hannah, okay, so way back when, this is almost a year ago, we um, are in need of a new website for HCI VRAC website, right? So about a year ago, we did a stakeholder interview with all the key leaders and all the key stakeholders in our community to gather our needs assessment. Then we collected all that data, we threw it out to World Usability Day, then amazing people like Hannah and Cindy, they produced some kind of, um, uh, they actually took it to high fidelity prototype, but they did both low fidelity, high fidelity prototype, and then they produced a recommendation on the result, okay? So then Jose got hired on to further that work and actually develop a design for a new website. So what this is, is this is actually a first iteration low fidelity paper prototype that he generated. And how did he generate it? He used an amazing tool called, well first he developed it, um, he uses the CS5 suite in most of his design work. But a lot of times when you're doing this stuff, CS5 is like throwing a 10,000 pound gorilla at this thing, right? So the first step is actually to use this amazing piece of software called OmniGraffle. You get, anybody ever heard of it? No. OmniGraffle, all right. So OmniGraffle is a really snazzy, low fidelity prototyping software where you start off with a blank slate then you can go off and you can get all kinds of amazing templates at Graffletopia, okay? So let's say that you want to develop an iPhone app or an iPad app or any kind of amazing software out there. You can go to Graffletopia. I guarantee they're going to have a stencil for you. You can come over here. And let's say that I'm going to develop, um, oh, let's say, an iPhone app. And I want to, or in Jose's case, you know, he's developing... A website, so now I have all these templates over here. So let's say that I'm going to develop an iPhone app, so all I have to do is drag and drop, and now I have this phone on there, and then I can automatically go through all of the stencils, 
And this is, you know, let's say that I'm going to have a keyboard, so I can go ahead and place that right there. So probably within about an hour or two, I could develop the entire prototype of how I want it. Now, this is a higher fidelity. I can make it wireframes. All right, so there's tons of stencils in here that would be more, um, so like, let's say, okay, we're not developing an iPhone app. Let's say instead we're developing a form, right? So I can come in here and I can, so I can come in here and I can go through and I can develop a whole form for how that looks, looks if you low fidelity and I can test it out, right? So I can add like, you know, lines and like a, where the logo would be. So I can basically design this way faster than if I were to use paper and pen or a pencil, okay? The tr trick is just what fidelity that you want. So then I produce all this, I print it all off, and now I bring a user in here. We have a table behind this hidden wall here, and we have Hal. So if you know Space um, Odyssey, this is Hal. And you can uh, remote view if you want to. You can add collaborators. So if you're working with companies and finding CEO types, it's a really good idea. Get buy-in or developer types. So they can do reviewing on here. You have the table right below. You have your person on here, and you can be actually running through a paper prototype. Okay. So you can see this is marked up for him to be able to, you know, let's say that... Um, Chase, right? Is that okay? So let's say that I would put this in front of Chase first, and I'd be like, okay, and this would be on a table, right? So I'd be like, okay, your mouse is now your finger. So Chase, um, what would you, you know? I'd give you a task, but I'd be like, okay, you're really interested. You um, you met Hannah in class today, and you really want to reconnect with her. So how would you go about finding the information to reconnect with Hannah? And notice my language. I'm not asking him find Hannah's email, right? That's basically measuring your ability to to follow directions, not what you actually grounding it in behavior, right? So you would go through and you would tell me what you would be doing, and I don't want to go too far into all these methods, but right. so go ahead, like, whatever you push. Okay. Oh, so people or something. Okay, and so then and you can keep it on top, yeah, so we'd have it on the table and he wouldn't actually be touching it, but so then be there and let's just pretend like that's the right one. And then you would keep clicking, and so then all of these are labeled in that, okay, so whatever he clicks, I have a corresponding, this is what I give you on the next step, mm. okay? Now, I can go ahead and I can be recording all of that, because I'm using some cool Camtasia via my viewer, and now I have a whole video playback I can analyze however I want to analyze it, um, and I can get an assessment, a data-driven, user-driven assessment of how you interact with my prototype, okay? So what Jose found out is that a lot of his prototype was, it didn't work. It failed on most tasks. Awesome. We learned a lot. And I didn't just give it to a developer <laughs> to develop and program and waste all of his or her time, right? Okay. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, have we figured out how to record from HAL yet? You can't record from HAL, but what you can do is you can view it and have Camtasia running and record your screen. Recording HAL. Hello. Hi. It's Jennifer. Hi, Jennifer. <laughs> Yeah, so that's the way to do it. I have an order in right now for a little plug-in that would allow for recording, but right now the easiest way is just to record your screen, do okay. a screen capture. Okay. Yep, okay. Um, so now let's say that um, after we're done with the low fidelity prototype, let's go ahead and kick it up a notch. So instead of um, just interacting with paper and having really low level interactions, Let's say now I want to kick it up a notch, and so he goes back to the drawing board, he breaks out his CS5 suite, and now he's going to actually redesign the site. But instead of, again, we don't want to program the whole thing, we actually want to be able to understand interactions. Um, all right, so if we want to actually do interactions. This is a software called Just In Mind, okay? And Just In Mind, um, the client-based side is called Just In Mind. The online version is called um, User Note, which we'll use in just a second. But this is Just In Mind. So the reason, uh, some other prototyping software that you may have heard of is Azure is really popular, um, Balsamic is really popular, and Just In Mind. Those are probably the top three in the industry. There's a ump billion of them out there, but anything that's worth their weight in gold, you're going to have to pay a little bit of money for. Sorry. Um, and the reason why I choose just in mind is one, it'll take you through all the levels of fidelity of a program. Okay, really important in prototyping software. Two, you can connect with back end if you have a really intense information architecture type project, or you're trying to understand the content on your back end, or you have a really um, robust database from which you know the interaction with that content is important. This will allow you to connect to that database, and so that you can actually provide real data in your prototype. Um, and the third reason is because it is the only software that allows for a 
plethora of interaction models. So typically with prototyping software, it's this hyperlink thing, which how many of our interactions right now are hyperlink interactions? If you think about it, we have a drop down, we have a mouse over, we have a right click, we have a left click, we have a, you know, I mean, the list goes on and on. Um, and so hyperlink is not helpful when we're trying to really assess behavior. So what this does is let's say now that Anytime somebody clicks on this faculty button, right, I can add all kinds of logic and I can add all kinds of interaction models. So I can do a click, a double click, a right click on keyboard press, on mouse over, and I can program it. And again, within, this is going to take a little bit longer, but probably within like five hours, I could get a fully functional prototype, which I can test with users, and I can ground it in data, and then actually know the direction. So we're not, again, wasting our time in development and on the back end with stuff that users don't want. Okay? Now let's say that I'm all done with this, and I want to go ahead and publish it online. So now I am going to go to the OneNote. Um, I'm sorry, user note. And this is the online version. So let's say that I am coordinating with Hannah. Okay. And let's say that Hannah and I, I need her feedback because she did this initial needs assessment with users and she did the initial prototyping. So I really want her feedback on this prototype. So then I can send the link to Hannah and now we can collaborate online with it. And this is going to take forever, so I'm going to just use login here. Sorry, I should have this one loaded. I forgot. All right, so this is just in mine. We go into user note. Hannah's going to go into her user note account and she can see the same thing. And have you guys noticed the network issues lately? Are we recording this screen? Yeah. they're blaming it on everyone bringing iPads and tablets as well as laptops. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That suddenly everyone has three internet connected devices instead of uh, one. <laughs> so now, voila, this is online. Hannah's remote. She can log in. She can look at this and she could be like, oh, okay, and see the facilities button work. So that program that I put in, it's a fully functional. And then she can give me comments and she could say, Andrea, what the hell were you thinking? This button sucks. Didn't you learn anything about Gestalt? Um, and so, and we can go back and forth on that. Okay, so we can redesign. I can fix it. I'd be like, thanks, Hannah. You're brilliant. I can fix it now. And so then, now we're ready to deploy it. So, fast forward. Now we can use this great tool called UserZoom. So, I'm just on my laptop. I don't even need to be in this lab. I can go to the UserZoom software. And now, I can go ahead and uh, put all my tasks in there. And now, I can deploy it to Hannah. Okay? Again, saying, hey, can you be my pilot? It's going to install an ActiveX control on the client side, and you can do moderated or unmoderated remote usability testing. You can add surveys, so if you want any demographic information, it's going to add it here. And so now, all right, and this is actually, all right, so this is going to start my task. So now I can measure time on task, measure task success, I can measure errors, I can measure efficiency, I can measure all the user experience behaviors. I can get a heat map of click events, I can do a path analysis of where the user traversed, so I can analyze all of that with this software. And I can give them this prototype, this is the low fidelity prototype that's actually interactive, but this gives me my task, I can interact with the prototype, and then I can move on to the next task, and I'm getting that all down as I'm going. I can also install the, pro the link that I sent to Hannah and have them actually interact with that prototype and get the same amount of data you know, all through UserZoom. Okay. So What's that software need, called? This is called UserZoom. User mm -hmm. yeah. Do you need to have a uh, username and password to access it? Or does the lab yep. have a central one? The lab has a central one. Yeah, we have two of them. Yeah. So all of you guys are welcome to use it and play with it. It's just when we actually, we're only allowed four active sessions. So that's where we have to do the book the lab and make sure that we kind of coordinate who's doing what when. Mm -hmm. You can have up to 100 participants. Um, there's also tons of other cool stuff that you can do in user Zoom. And if you, again, if you come to the 570 class, I'm going to be talking a lot about it. But you can do like site intercept stuff. 
So if you just kind of want a random sample of people visiting particular places, you can do that. Um, you can do it on personas or profile based. So I only want men who are 55 or over to take the feasibility test on this site. You can do that. Um, you can do logic. So anybody who clicks on this button, we want to make sure they take the usability test in order to see if they'll do it. So you can add all kinds of really cool stuff in there. Um, so that is user zoom. Now let's say that you have a client based system that you need to test, or let's say you have something in this 3D world that you need to test. So for instance, um, some of Hannah, Hannah's colleagues in another class did a heads up display, which was really cool. They went out and they were trying to, do you guys know what a heads up display is in a car? Yeah. So they were trying to assess a new design for a heads up display. So they went out and took out, took all these amazing high def photos around Ames and they simulated like these big computer screens. They had all those camera pictures up there and then they simulated like you were in a car. And so they had all this really cool stuff and they had the heads up display right there on the dashboard of the actual pictures and photos that they took and you could see Ames in the background. It was really cool. And they used a software called Moray because Moray, it's a little bit more of a 10,000 pound, actually I'm gonna show you on this one. It's a little bit more of a 10,000 pound gorilla. Um, but it will let you do some pretty amazing things. So this is an example of Moray. Um, you can kind of see it on both computers. But this is where, again, it'll deliver the task. It'll measure all the user experience measures. But this one's cool because it captures the face. And it also has this manager session where now I can get, this is me interacting with the HCI website. So now I can generate all kinds of graphs and I can understand you know, what my task success was at any given task. And I can break it down into all of that. And I can generate just a ton of really good reports. Um, and a presentation. So for instance, this is a final presentation that I was given, or that I was going to give. I was really tired when I was doing this, so that's why I feel like I'm falling asleep in it. So this is a presentation that now I can give and deliver to my development team to say, you know, problem, problem, problem. I can add tests, test text on the screen, and I can show how to do that. So I can break it down per task and give all of that information. So that's more right. Another way that you can use more is you can actually deploy, re deploy recorders on each one of these, and then you could be observing from a third station. I've had up to four usability testing participants in here at any given time. And we use these walls to separate them. So it's another way that you can kind of reorganize the room. And that is, so what questions do you guys have so far on usability testing? How, how did you use Moray to do as a display testing? It's not really interactive, it's, or are you using it for eye tracking or see if it was successful? It wasn't me, it was a, another team. And actually what they were doing is they were trying to evaluate the, the interface for the, um, kind of the, the touch interface of kind of a Garmin or, oh. or that sort of thing while yeah. the heads up just, and kind of that yeah. interaction between oh, okay. us. Yeah. So the, the user wasn't directly interacting with the heads up display, but they were getting information and then right. using that information to interact with the Right. Cool. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you can also, even though it's not totally real, you could use a mouse as your input, you know, instead of a touch. Right. Even though the input method is going to promote some kind of issue, um, it still gives you a little bit of like time on task and you can kind of find it. And so are these touch screens then? So you could you touch them? No. Oh, okay. This one is. I'd be willing to go down that path with you if you want to try to figure that out. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, that one is a touch screen. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yep, there's nothing to say. You couldn't. And actually, I just found a really cool piece of software to analyze mobile apps, um, usability testing on mobile apps. And so, theoretically, we could probably deploy that same software on this system. You know what I mean? And ca capture that. So, yeah. Yeah, be fun. Um, so, that's Moray. Um, so, again, two options for usability testing both Moray and User Zoom. User Zoom, great for remote. Moray, better if you have a client based or if you just want a little bit more robustness in your analysis. Well, and user zoom, you have to have a deployed website yeah. in order to, to do your task analysis. Yeah. So if, you're, if you have like a desktop app, like say your biology, mm -hmm. um, some sort of application that you're trying to test, then that might not be suitable for user zoom. I have had one client that, that made it work, but you have to trick your uh, system <laughs> to say what is actually a deployed website or not. So okay. it's possible, but it's really hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that's another thing to yeah. consider when you're picking. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so that is more right. All right, so let's go through, let's say that, um, you know, this video is really important too, because then uh, I can take this video and do all kinds of really cool stuff with it. All right, so keep that in your mind as we go forward. All right, so let's go through. Um, there's another tool, the eye tracking software and hardware. So this is a VT2. It was originally designed for people who don't have any limbs to as an input device, so the eyes could be the input device. 
Um, so it's a little bit lower, it captures at a little bit lower rate. The, the top of the line out there is TOBI and SMI. Those are kind of the top two. So if you're doing more co cognitive studies, um, I maybe caution you a little bit and look at the theory as to whether that device, its capture rate, is sufficient enough for the cognitive study that you're trying to do. But for all UX purposes, it is plenty sufficient for capture rate. Um, so that's the eye tracking software. So now I can set up an eye tracking software. So in this one, I'm measuring Hoover vacuum cleaner. And if you take 570, this is going to look familiar. So I had a couple participants come in here and I say, all right, you're interested to buy a new vacuum cleaner. And I work for Hoover. And I want to know, how can we improve our website to make sure that you buy the $300 vacuum cleaner and not the $100 vacuum cleaner? All right. Um, no, I'm just kidding, that's marketing. I want you to have the best experience possible, really love Hoover, <laughs> and just enjoy our website. That's a UX word. Okay. All right, so now I'm going to go through, and um, I've gone through on Hoover, and I've done the study. I, I have four participants in here, two males, two females, okay? Um, normally you want eight for testing, but for this intense purposes, I have four. We're just going to use that. Um, Why do you want eight? How are you with that number? Um, so it used to be five. The old Nielsen study, it used to be five, gives you about 85% of um, your usability issues, or at least what like 80% of the population is actually going to find as an issue. Um, but the latest, I think it was in Interactions Magazine, they had a really nice experiment that said, eh, it's not really five, it's really eight um, from a statistical standpoint. Okay. So yeah, that's the latest. There's not large agreement around that, but okay. that was the, the, <laughs> the latest study done on it, and it had pretty sound stats around it. So eight's the new, the new fact. Um, could change tomorrow. Uh, okay, so I am going to look at my cool Hoover study that I've just done, and I've gone through and I've analyzed it, and now I want to actually look at my results, okay? And so this is um, just a couple studies. I have, um, this actually just did one responded, but that's okay. Um, so this is a heat map of how this person went through, right? And you can see, wow, they spent a lot of time on this navigation. So they're not even looking at my really cool visuals, right? I mean, I just paid a lot of money for my nice little visual guy to give me an icon to say, buy this, and nobody's even looking at it. So um, that tells me something. And also, okay, wow, so these are where I want to put my low-scored vacuum cleaners because nobody's getting to the bottom of the page. All right. This is through eye tracking. Yep, this is eye tracking. Yep, so this is a heat map. So uh, red how, is... How good is it? I mean, the sense that, I mean, it's the head moves up a little bit, does it, you know, mess it We up? don't allow head movement. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> 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 no, um, so you'll know, so this study, so to answer your question specifically, um, we are at 100%. This one's at 99, 100, 98. So it's pretty good. It's 100%. Mm -hmm. Means um, that we kept capturing, that we didn't lose the pupil during that time. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's okay if your head moves a little bit. But, and this is also on an ergonomic arm. So if everybody came in the same shapes and sizes, it'd be a lot easier, but it's not. And so, yeah, we have an ergonomic arm here so you can adjust. I will say the longest thing that takes for eye tracking study is the calibration. So you calibrate to each person the eye um, at the initial study, and then you'll know. And if you really need to get pretty specific, so on the calibration, if we look here on our calibration, and let's say that for my Mr. Anonymous, right? So I can see this is pretty dang good. So this is, you know, our pupils don't look in the same spot. Crazy, right? I always thought they did until I started doing eye tracking studies, and I'm like, whoa, I don't even look cross-eyed, but dang, I'm this bad. And uh, so this one, the right eye kind of veered off a little bit, left eye kind of veered off a little bit here. But in terms of calibration, I mean, everything's pretty much on target. It's pretty good. Um, all right, and so let's go back to our cool study because I'm about ready to amaze you. No, I'm just kidding. Um, all right, so let's go back to we are trying to analyze how well this did. So this is another heat map. So this time they went a little bit further. That's interesting. So I'd go back to my study and say, what was different about this task? Or, you know, what was different about this time that they actually spent more time exploring? Or what was different about this person that they spent more time? Um, this is uh, areas of interest, and we're actually going to go to, so let's say that I'm really interested in, see this really amazing icon that I made because I really want people to buy this. This is my $300, right? And if I give them a top rated because we all just love to be popular, maybe I can get some money. So let's see. 
Um, here's my area of interest. So basically, time to first fixation. It took them 104 seconds to get there. That's bad. Um, time spent, zero. Ratio, nobody. Zero people looked at it. <laughs> so that strategy's not going to work. Okay, well, what about my, this is the way my, my business makes money. We do ads. So let's see how many times people actually looked at this or paid attention. Okay, uh, 26 seconds to get there. Um, 12, second, 12 seconds that they spent on it. Yay, yes, that's good money. Um, and one out of one people got there. So that's great, right? Mm -hmm. Cool. Advertising's working, so I still can stay in business. So then I can just do an analysis on my whole site, okay? And, I mean, you can break it down into whole sections. Um, I mean, really, there's so many possibilities with this on where you want to go, okay? Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, all right, so then... Uh, da, da, da. Another one you can do is your gaze reply. She was just working on this. Let's do this one. And I can do my gaze replay. Uh, of course it's gonna, all right, let's go down so they're stuck there. So this is my gaze replay of how they worked, right? So this is what you're seeing right now is anytime that, that circle gets bigger, it's a fixation, and the bigger it is, the longer they're fixating on that spot. The line is a saccade. Um, typically, we're not processing information in a saccade, or it's not processing, or it's not information that we're gonna really kind of take to the bank. Um, so this is an analysis of that. So what I can do then is I can pause it, I can see, okay, give me everything. Where did this whole site look? Whoa! All right, so that's good. They spent most of the time on the content areas. Not bad, all right. So now I can really hone in on particular points in time whenever I'm giving them information. I can see what they did. Um, I can see you know total fixation. And then I can get an output, a huge Excel output with all of this information. So I can do further analysis on where, when, and why. What do you do with that, with all that Excel data? What kind of tasks do you usually pay attention to? Depends on your research question. Okay. Oh, when you, I was thinking of the, when you were developing a prototype, mm -hmm. what do you usually... Depends what your research question. So it depends on, okay, so let's say that um, going into this prototype, I know that if on here, right? So let's go back to the scenario. So Chase just, um, he just met Hannah in a class and he wants to make sure that he can find her afterwards, right? So right now on this prototype, how he would find her is under people, mm -hmm. right? So if I go back and I say it took them 10 seconds to find people, well, UX theory would suggest that if somebody's not finding something in 8 seconds and they know their target, it's a fail. Okay. So I would go back to my prototype guy and be like, this is either in the wrong spot, it's the wrong word, something's wrong, but they're not finding it in the time that they need to find it. And usually uh, you just change it intuitively, whatever it feels like would be a... Uh, An adjustment. So you're you're going down blue hole number one right now. You know the matrix. You want the red or the blue? You're totally looking <laughs> a blue hole. All right. So um, <laughs> this is the answer to that question relies a lot on. I mean, there are design principles out there that you would want to go back to. Um, maybe you have a backlog of user data that you could go into. Maybe there's a culture of identity that you can rely on in terms of where does that go. Maybe there's some kind of design guidelines for your particular company that you can rely on. Um, or you can talk to a really good graphic artist be like, how would, or visual, I would actually say more like a visual designer to say, what would your next recommendation be? Okay. That's if you think it's in the wrong spot or it's just not in a, in a dominant enough spot given that that's one of our most important features, mm -hmm. okay? Now let's say that you think that maybe it's the wrong word, okay? So Chase keeps saying, you know, HCIers. He's not saying people. He's saying, well, there's some HCIers that I really know, and I'm trying to find this one HCI or Hannah, but we're using people. So in Chase's world, people does not equate to HCIers. Okay? So in that case, I would probably deploy um, something around a card sort or information architecture project. Um, and so that would be more, uh, let me show you this. So this is a websort.net. This is actually a free software. It's amazing. You can only have 10 participants, but you can actually then deploy. Let me give you, and actually Jose did this um, for this particular art, um, website, so we knew what words we needed to use in the navigation system. So he 
took all these words and all of these words and all of the sub options for navigation, he threw them all into this card sort, and then he deployed it to our HCI community. So they were all over here. So then somebody had to go through and they actually placed, oh, I think people should go under contacts and you know what I mean? And so then we were able to um, get, I don't know if you've seen them before. It's not crowdsource. I mean, it's talk to your users. We deployed it to our users and oh. asked them to help us develop the site according to their behavior and their semantical their semantics. So, yeah. Um, so I might be able to pull this up quick. Sorry, I feel like I'm going way over on time. Hannah, you can pull me off the stage whenever you need to. I'll give you an hour and a half. So okay. You're doing fine. Sweet. Okay. Um, <laughs> you guys are stuck, suckers. Just kidding. Um, all right, so let's look in here, and I'll show you what pr what was produced from Jose's work um, that we did on, and Hannah did actually a card. So you did a card sort too, and yours a little bit, right? A modified one. I don't think so. No. Okay. So hopefully this is the right one. So this is the output of one of the card sorts that Jose did. Oh, what I did was I examined um, other HCI sites and then saw where they put the various Oh, okay, got it. Categories. Okay. So contextual analysis. Oh, okay, got it. Oh, come on. <laughs> Seriously? We have no. I think it requires you to answer those two questions. Seriously? Yeah, no. <laughs> I hate you, Microsoft. All right. Sorry if anybody works for Microsoft. All right. Um, Nick has informed us that he's drank the Kool Aid. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So this is what's called a, a tree, a word tree, um, which then we can just open up my document in Excel. All right. Okay. So, for instance, this gives me. So, these are all the categories. So, I think there's an open card sort and a closed card sort where you allow your users to actually create the categories or you give them the categories. And this was an open card sort, so they could tell us what those categories were. So, categories usually equate to like main navigation buttons, right? And then subcategories are what well, they call items, but those would be what goes underneath those navigation categories, okay? Um, and so this would be an example. This just tells us how people group, grouped them. So how many total items versus unique items across all participants. Um, and let me, I want to show you guys the item per category. All right. And so this is a, yeah, here we go. So what you want to see in good information architecture where people can find things you want to see really strong, this should be a perfect diagonal with strong clusters, these blue clusters, in a strong diagonal. That means that you're doing something right, your website is well organized, and you're using the right language. If you see this, that basically means that everybody who sorted C6, right, they sorted into facilities. You got 43 people, right, 43 times that happened, so that's a pretty good one, right, and there's blue, it's high, that's good, but if you look at, let's see, blog, we've got seven people that think it should be in about, seven people that think it should be in admission, seven people that think it should be in announcements and things, seven people that think it should be in conversations, seven people that think it should be in events and programs, I mean, so, that we have a problem. Right? I mean, <laughs> we don't know what to call that, you know? <laughs> um, and so this is where I would actually come in and I would do some kind of card sorting activity within, like, an affinity diagramming activity with a group in order to determine language. But a tree, a car, a tree like this, that's bad. That was really bad. But what was really interesting is that when I helped them do this analysis, we actually looked at the department. So we looked, we split it up in terms of on campus versus off campus. There was some agreement when we started to look at off campus, but on campus, we're still not in agreement. But when we broke up on campus into engineering based and non-engineering based, there we started to see agreement in engineering versus non-engineering, right? So okay, we're on to something. So maybe in our navigation schema we need to appeal to those groups, you know, because this level of people not talking the same language, okay, round peg square hole. We gotta come up with a different strategy, right? So that's so that's to answer your question in a really longer way than you probably uh, anticipated. 
that's where you can go back and say, what what is the nature of the problem with our design? Okay. So I mean, like a person has to define himself before he enters the website. Like, oh, yeah. I'm an engineer, okay, then you change the things. Yeah, I mean, that's how we designed it, because we had a hunch that these personas within HCI VRAC were, were why people couldn't agree, because um, we have a bit of an identity that's, issue like on our hands. Work for half the, yes. What's triple the work for half the day? I mean, you know, basically you have to three different three designs, right? I mean, Not necessarily. Four. Not necessarily. Right? So, you're, so, okay, so you're, so, computer scientist, right? You're thinking functionality, <laughs> what the hell do I do with that, right? Okay, so I would come and I would say, don't worry, Mr. Computer Scientist, we'll make sure we ground it in data, right? So I would probably develop a new prototype where, okay, let's say that Chase is calling people HCIers, okay? Bethany's calling people my peeps, all right? And Hannah's calling people people, all right? So maybe we could test three different prototypes, Right? Where we have it in a different location and a different word and we test, you know, how, can they accomplish the task? That could be one way of getting it. Maybe we could say, well, instead of people, maybe we just say HCI people. Kind of a peeps people, people, HCIers. Maybe that's the solution, right? So there's a million of solutions. And of course, technical feasibility should weigh into what also is possible. Okay. So just because you have the data doesn't mean that yet there's necessarily a, this is what we have to do with it. We just, now at least we know that's the problem. So instead of you spending countless amount of hours developing this amazing navigation system under people, which nobody can actually get to, we're actually going to help you out a little bit. Okay. And by we, it's not the we versus me class. <laughs> All right. Okay, so back to eye tracking. All right, so we realize there's a problem. Um, all right, so we can get all this great stuff. Another thing we can do, bee swarms. We can aggregate across participants. Um, and this is the bee swarm. So this is an aggregate of the heat map across all participants. Strange, he's not going to us 25% at all. I know, right? Okay, <laughs> so in 25%, man, come on. Like, I'm giving him a good deal. What's my problem? Yeah. It's a good observation. It's a good fine print. Do, do you have an idea of why that might be? From a design standpoint? What's the most common eye tracking pattern? Left to right. Nope. Oh, L. Close. It's an inverted L, yeah. The F pattern. The F pattern is the most common eye tracking pattern. Now, I think 85% of the population has an F pattern on whatever they want. So they go, they start here, they go, and it tapers off. And then they go down a little bit, and they go, and it only gets to about here, and then it tapers, and then they're done. That's all you got. Okay. The second most popular is a, is a cake, a layered cake. Jump, and then. And then there's a couple other. But those are the two most common patterns. So where is my critical 25% coupon in that whole equation? Wrong side. Yeah, right? What the heck are they thinking? It's numeric. It would go up. It's logical, right? All right. Humans are not logical. Just, yeah. All right. So yeah. So maybe but it also would... depends on what this task was. That's true. If the yep. task was to log in That's or something true. like that, they could be looking in the places where they're asking. To That's true. That's a really good point. Yep. And just lately... Yeah. Add blindness. Yep, yep, that's a really good point. Yep. All right, so um, the last one here is you can go back to stats. So you can analyze your website. Now, I can also, um, let me show you another one here. I could do this where I'm actually capturing face, too. So I think I, yeah. So in here, I capture a person's face. Um, and let's see, this is a heat map. This was something else we were trying out. Um, let me show you. Um, so you can see here that this is a shared program. So you can see everybody's. Is your beehive one still in here? Photo hive? Yeah, photo hive. never did eye tracking. Oh, that's right, you did. Yeah, that's right. Never mind. Um, so this is going to take forever. So we can capture a video and then we can actually pull that video out into what Eduardo was asking about earlier. Now I can put that um, video capture into face reading software, which this is like the coolest software ever. So if you know anything about affect, there's um, five basic emotions. And yes, that is contentious. And yes, there's not large agreement in the field about that. But if you ask most scientists, there's five basic emotions. Okay. Um, if you're interested in affect studies, then I would recommend that you look at the work of Picard. She's by far kind of the leader in the field. And she does a really some cool stuff with galvanic skin response, which I'm trying to get lab. So if you're interested in galvanic skin response, let me know so I can support my case. Um, okay, 
So this is um, me, again, really tired. I'm listening to directions from a sales rep, and I was kind of annoyed at the you time. You should ask that new, there's a new girl, Amanda, I don't know her last name. Okay. But they have a whole bunch of, like, body metric stuff set up in the C6, and she was, she's been working with it. Cool. Okay. So okay. That'd be awesome. Yeah. Introduce me or something. Um, so this is the six basic emotions. So now I can take that video that I just took from my more or from my eye tracker or whatever it was, and now I can feed it into Face Reader. And now I can see, you know, how am I doing on a particular task? It's all on a timeline. So I sync up my timeline, and I'm like, whoa, I was really angry and really sad. <laughs> That's probably not a good thing. Do glasses, um, do, um, glasses will affect it, I guess. Nope. No? No. Nope. Okay. I haven't found that to be the case yet. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There are some things, like sometimes bangs messes up the eye tracker. Don't know why. Um, it's also not very good at, um, like some Asian eyes are really hard for it to pick up. Um, but those are probably the two biggest ones. Oh, Cindy and sometimes if you're... Your eye makeup. Yeah, Cindy was saying she had some problems with eye makeup. And then also if you're very, very dark skinned, sometimes that. Um, but yeah, so that uh, so that will measure affect. So then if you're doing an affect study, that could be one part of your triangle. And so you can measure, okay, not only is the eye tracking data saying they're not seeing the 25% coupon, they are really unhappy at that point in the task, and they're not clicking on it. So right now I have a pretty good picture that our 25% icon, our 25% coupon, given the task, um, is not effective. So we need to change it. Okay. All right. Um, last thing um, that I want to show is an observing software. So if you're doing any kind of behavioral research or social science type research, or even if you're doing um, in the 3D world, so for instance, I just did this combine study where we're testing a new technology, and we want to see how many times the operator turns out to look at the auger to see trust in the system, and if their behavior changes with or without the system. Okay, so this is something that I coded up, right? So I have a code book and I say anytime that their head turns left, I'm going to code it with that. So then I can run all kinds of crazy cool, cool statistics on that. So I can run through and now it is, hopefully it has my, so this is a video. And so it's going through. It's playing on the screen. Oh, there we go. That's fine. Um, so that's a video. So anytime that my head turns left, it's going to code it. And you can see here that. So left, capture, left, capture. So the blue is, okay, I'm capturing it. So now I can code all this, I can run statistics, and I can do an analysis on what percent of the time, what was my standard deviation, what was my average, what was my min, what was my max, at what point, and do all kinds of crazy cool stuff with behavioral tracking. So you, are you grabbing a, a chunk and saying, my head was turned left during this? You can do either. Answer. You can do a start, stop, or you can do, as soon as I hit start, capture that chunk when I hit stop. That's a chunk, or it could just be a point. Yeah, you can, yeah, you can choose. What other questions do you guys have? Was this Moray Observer? No, this is Noldis Observer. Oh. Yeah, this is Noldis. Um, this is Face Reader again by Noldis, um, and then this one is Attention Tool. Um, it's also called Eye Motions, and it's coupled with a VT2, and that whole thing makes our eye tracking system. Do you need a special type of camera to use the face reader? Can that, any yep. video just be okay? Any video, yeah. I mean, we use just that webcam right there, Logitech webcam. So, I'm sure if it's... Uh, but you have to make sure like, people don't touch their face and all that. Like, otherwise, sure. when you really touch your face a lot. Sure, but that's experimental design, right? I mean, anytime that you're working with humans, I'm going to guarantee that they're going to do something to mess up your study. <laughs> yeah, it's something. They're going to do something. That's why I work with machines. <laughs> <laughs> Spoken like a true computer scientist. <laughs> No, I mean, they're going to do something. So that's where good experimental design comes in. Um, and also, I mean, whenever we're reporting on our study findings, right, we should have, you know, in that quadrant of potential reasons why this messed up, one of those quadrants is experimental design flaw. Yeah. So, and just be able to speak to it. Do you ever use any, when I was doing web development stuff, we used just mouse tracking, which seems really, it's not nearly as cool as eye tracking. Would you use yeah. that in conjunction with eye tracking, or is that something that just doesn't matter now? When you say mouse tra tracking, do you mean where their mouse is? Exactly. It sucks with touchscreen stuff. Uh -huh. you even... Yeah. Again, I'm going to go back to it all depends on your question. It doesn't tell you a lot. Um, and I would actually say that eye tracking doesn't tell you a lot by itself, right? Mm -hmm. Any of this biometric stuff doesn't tell you a lot by itself. It tells you what's happening. It has no idea why. 
or the context or anything. So I think it's okay to use. I actually I have a study right now where he's making the assertion that wherever the mouse is, um, there's interaction zones. And so if the mouse is in that interaction zone, then it suggests that they are present interacting with that zone, even though the mouse isn't moving, it's in the zone. And so that's good, but he's also triangulating that with, is there a click event in the zone, and is there eye tracking in the zone? And so I think if you triangulate, you can use it. But that alone, doesn't really tell you anything. Yeah. What other questions do you guys have? I mean, am I over? What time are we supposed to go to? 7.30. 7 7 7 7 7 7 7 yeah. I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, so in the last half hour, you have pretty rapidly gone through, I don't know, five to ten tools and, and maybe five to ten, like, sort of techniques. Yeah. Um, in the lab that you'll be teaching next month, yeah. do you plan on spending, like, a Saturday morning on each thing? Um, not on each thing, but yes, the, the purpose of that class is to go more in depth. So right now, there was, up until um, about a year ago, there was 150 methods that the usability body of knowledge would say are available to us as UX practitioners. The work that's going on over in Europe blew that up, and now there's about 350 methods that we can choose from. Now, that's just methods then if you want to exponentially increase that and multiply that for the amount of tools that can support those methods, it gets crazy. So in the class, I will focus on the triangulation method. One point on the triangle is eye tracking. One point is UX measures, either being Warrior or user zoom, And then one point is your choice. And so you can choose any of the tools that I had just shown today as that third point in the triangle, and I'll go in depth with you on the tool you choose. So will you, will each of the Yeah, unfortunately, if you're remote, your options are going to be more limited than if you're in class. Um, so, yeah, we'll have to kind of work through that. You'll be partnered with somebody in class, so you'll kind of be working through them on the software. But as a um, remote, I can only give you access to the stuff that is remote optional, you know, remote available. And then you'll be working with an in-class student. You know, basically, they could either be a robot or they could be, show, you know, doing something. And you could be working with them on that. Does that answer my question? It did, but it brought up another question. Okay. Um, do you, so I'm getting a feeling like maybe this wouldn't be the best thing for a remote student? Um, it just, it kind of depends on what you have available in your specific situation. Like, there's lots of industry folks that have access to an eye tracking piece of equipment. Or if you're a UX practitioner that is wanting to build a lab or build your, your program, um, it would be a great exposure into what you should buy and what you shouldn't. Um, That's I think. Good, right there. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that, th this will give you that. Okay. So, and I'll be very candid. I mean, I'll, I'll flat out admit who my biases are, which CEOs I know and respect, and that's why I'm selling their, you know, are, are believing in their product, but it's also because it's a good piece of product. Um, and I'll tell you where they're not so good and kind of cost benefit. Yeah. Yeah. What other questions are there? Is there any way you can equate um, eye tracking to how interesting the site is or how interesting the site is to the user, for instance? Um, interesting is a really loaded word. So let's say you say that the more movement there is, uh -huh. the more there are things to see, so the more interesting. Um, I would say you have to triangulate to make any kind of causal claim. Um, but if you say, okay, I'm giving them an explore task, and the more places they explore on my site, it's for game, right? So if their eye travels more and I have more fixations, then that potentially says that they're more engaged in my game. I could potentially buy that, and we tracked how many times they actually click or how much time they spend on a particular task, or whether they reported that I love your game and I want to use it always and ever and forever and ever, amen, um, then you might have some pretty good data, you know, especially if you throw in kind of a seven-point Likert scale and, you know, in social science, if you're getting any kind of, like, 
two point deviation on that scale between you show them, you know, a couple prototypes and they're loving one two points higher than another and they're spending more time on it and their eyes are going to more places and you have fixation. Okay, now you're starting to make a pretty good case. Um, I would also probably go back to the literature too to see in game development if, you know, <coughs> what are the eye tracking studies that have been done in games and what theories have been constructed there. Question. I know. Yeah. I mean, eye tracking, I will honestly say eye tracking is sexy, it's hot, it's tangible, right? Oh, they're looking there, this means this! No, sorry. I wish I could offer you that, but I can't. Remember, humans are crazy, we do all kinds of crazy stuff. We could be looking at a spot, fixation, duration for like 100 seconds and be thinking about what we're going to have for dinner tonight, right? I mean, crazy, wacky creatures. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I have one more logistics question. Yeah, yeah. No. Okay. So I think I would have mutiny on my hands. <laughs> so we'll be able to hear students' questions, because right now I couldn't really hear what the other people were saying. Oh, you are just opening up Pandora's box. <laughs> <laughs> um, so technically, um, are, we, are we distributing this video? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm so I'm going to give you the parting line. Um, so... Uh, we recognize that audio is a problem for most students, and I'm working with EL ELO to try to fix it. I will also be bringing in my own recording devices and probably posting my own recording stuff and have each group have their own digital recorder, which will be recording. So, um, I, I so yeah, that's, but it is a, a challenge. I, mean, I have a solution to that. Whatever question we ask, you just repeat it when you're recording. Yeah, I wish. That's a good, that's, yeah. That's a good, yeah. Yep. You don't need, like, seven different. Yeah, um, yeah. It, sometimes that's hard though, because as a remote student, like wait, okay, so how, so just even so what you just said, you know what I mean? So now we're increasing our time, total time in class right. by at least, you know, every minute per question. That's an, a one issue. The second issue is that, um, sorry, uh, Jennifer, right? Yeah. Jennifer, and say it again. Pascal. 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 Pascar? Okay. So I basically am now the median between you and Jennifer, which is so sad because you guys could love each other. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, you guys could be interested in the same thing, and then Jennifer makes a connection with Pascar. Like, Pascar, that was a great question. Now I'm connected to you instead of me droning. Pascar just asked the question, blah, 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 which I will never do it justice because I'll probably use different words, and so that's part of that problem. But you're right. Repeating it can reduce the issue. Which, if anybody is interested in remote tech, like, teaching and systems that support remote teaching, another huge money maker. Lots of money in that field. It sucks right now. The, the system's just. <laughs> Are there any upcoming systems to allow tracking and like seasick eye tracking? Yes, ASL mobile. Like um, get to stereo glasses. Uh, yes. So we have two projects underway. So Jacob, the amazing undergrad who is actually working with me on the combine, he's trying to make a pair of eye tracking, head mounted eye tracking. Um, I'm going to throw out my bias. I strongly disagree with any kind of head mounted anything unless it is completely non invasive feeling. Um, there is ASL, which is one of the top of the lines, has a mobile eye that's promising, which I'm going to get my hands on tomorrow. Um, so I will be able to report back to you as to whether that is a good solution. Now, in terms of analyzing that data, oh, no, nah, that's hard. Well, um, what I want is, um, so the Boeing pilots mm -hmm. say that they have this image. Okay. And where, how they line up. So they have director lights when they're coming into the tanker plane. We're working with an F-15 and a tanker yeah. and studying that between mono and stereo. And they say after so long, they no longer use the director lights to get in position, but they use their canopy and they connect points on the tanker. And none of them can explain what that image is. Yeah. What do they connect? Where, how do they do it? Mm -hmm. And so I think eye tracking would be really interesting if we take this project from the professionals to an actual training simulator yeah. for new pilots. Yeah, so what you need to do is we need to go talk to get Stephen and Elliot together um, because there's a project underway right now or in discussion mm -hmm. that if you have a head mounted eye tracking system and you have a three dimensional world, you can capture the data. We have devices mm -hmm. to capture the data, but now analyzing it, you're going to have to feed that video into some kind of code. 
to say zone B, zone A, zone C, zone whatever, you know what I mean? Right, and then what does that zone mean? It's similar to areas of interest, mm -hmm. right? You're going to have to promote or provide what are your areas of interest in the three-dimensional world to make meaning of your data. Mm -hmm. So that is a huge open CV problem, right? Yeah. So I think we're going to maybe try to get, um, uh, oh my gosh, maybe it's escaping me, Zhang, to try to um, do that, okay. find that algorithm to do that. So mm -hmm. if there is another industry need, because Deer is trying to do the same thing. Um, maybe we could, you know, mono and mono. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. All right. What other questions do you guys have? How many people are enrolled in the lab so far? Uh, I want to say we're probably going to get about 30, I'm going to guess. Because okay. we have quite a bunch of people from industry that are wanting to come. So, okay. yeah. I'll try to keep industry type people and research type people separated, but. Unless you want to cross pollinate, but that's usually not a good idea in those situations. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, right now it's about thirty. Okay. Yeah. yeah. What other questions do you guys have? Why well, is it not a good idea to cross pollinate? What are they? Um, <laughs> put them in the same groups. Um, one, I think there is oftentimes an age maturity difference and a life maturity difference that just kind of. Uh, gets in the way of the learning. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing is that because HCI is such an applied field, um, I think a lot of times people out in the industry have kind of, uh, they're latching on to wherever they came from and now they're in UX jobs and they're trying to apply where they came from to where they're currently at, whatever processes they're currently having to deal with in UX versus I think researchers who haven't had a lot of industry experience, they're a little bit more pure blank slate um, so they can come at it more from a the fundamentals and move forward, um, which so just m makes for a little bit more. You need to allow for more time for you to like bridge that gap, and that's not the purpose of that course. So. Oh, okay. In five ninety one, on the other hand, that is the purpose. So for you to be in groups that are interdisciplinary, both research academic as well as discipline based. So, yeah, that's why. And hopefully I didn't offend any of you industry or research types when I made that statement. <laughs> what other questions do you guys have? What about the audio permits? Oh, yeah, thanks. Okay, so, you know, okay, this is a little bit of a black guy. Um, so, thanks. Um, okay, so I had this really amazing plan uh, that focus groups, actually. Hannah ran a bunch of focus groups. Um, so my goal in that was that's the same quality equipment that you would find in ELO. And so... You can hook people up, you can have them in focus groups, or you can be doing an affinity diagram, or you can have any kind of like activity, they could be moving, they could be, you know, whatever, dynamic, they're wearing their mics, and so you could be capturing all these voice, this voice streams, um, and if you have a unidirectional mic, then you can actually plug that into this amazing iDictate software that then can transcribe it for you, and oh, you can do this concert analysis, but I have this grand vision. All right, a couple problems. One, that equipment is uber complicated. Um, two, not a lot of people are doing that kind of level of uh, user activity in groups. Um, three, uh, the software, well, the unidirectional, those came with multi-directional mics, and the unidirectional mics were actually an additional charge, which nobody wanted to pay for. And then four, um, as Hannah can well speak to, um, this amazing iDictate software that I thought we could actually, you know, put in um, unidirectional, one voice, uh, feedback and then get it transcribed is actually a huge pain in the ass and doesn't work very well. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, natural language processing uh, it just is not where it needs to be yet. We're close. We're really close, but it's not there yet. So, yeah. So another field. Anybody wants to get into it? Ching ching. Yeah. But especially if you get any kind of other voice on that, it just all goes to hell in a handbasket really quick. Well, and everyone has to enunciate slowly. Exactly. <laughs> and people, when they're in focus groups, mumble all the time right. and talk over each other. Right, right. So I'm actually looking for, if anybody is wanting to use that equipment, I would gladly love to see it. I would love to see it used um, more for what we paid for it. Um, that is the one thing I can't uh, but it's limited brag about. To multiple. Groups. It is a multi-directional. I, I could probably get you a unidirectional if you really need it. Um, I was just thinking for the Boeing study because we're going to do an interview and then we're going to do a focus group. Honestly, your best bet is going to be these guys. Okay. Digital recorders. It's going to be fast and easy. You can record. You can put it in higher transcriptions for multi-voice. Okay. That's going to be your best bet. Okay.
Yeah, I wish I could tell you different. <laughs> <laughs> I really do. <laughs> Yeah. So you just pay some money to type it out. That's mm -hmm. okay. Do it yourself. Yeah. yeah. We're gonna do it. Yeah. If anybody has transcribed, it takes about two hours for every hour of uh, maybe three. Um I depending say, on I think I was doing about a half hour for ten minutes. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty painful. Um and to pay for it it's usually about a hundred bucks an hour, roughly. So with multi voice it gets probably more than the hundred and fifty dollar range. Yeah, and put it in your budget. I honestly, I would get a transcriptionist at some of your time, because your time is going to be used in data analysis. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and then even once you get a transcribed, you're still going to have to do some kind of content analysis on it. So, right. get a transcribed, get LA to fund it. Okay. Yeah, it'll be that. That fight's worth. <laughs> yeah, yes. and he can talk to <laughs> yeah, and he can talk to Stephen about we're using a transcriptionist right now, and there's an approved list for BRAC. Uh -huh. You have to make sure that's in your IRB. Currently, it's not. We could probably add it. Well, did you say you were going to capture voice, though? So that should cover it. But having somebody else listening to it? Oh, you just have to add that person, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. Wait a minute. What other questions do you guys have? Any off campus? Paige and this yeah. other guy? Paige? Jumped off because she couldn't get any of the audio to work. Oh, and okay. Whoa, what just happened? Bradley. Okay. Bradley. Bradley, you're still there, Bradley. Has he ever had audio on? Mm. He's typing. Yes, I am off. Campus. Okay. Sweet. Do you have any questions, Bradley? it would be awesome to get a list of all the software we discussed. Go on to the Usability Lab website and look at the inventory list. You will see everything there. And this is my final last shameless plug. Um, probably not so shameless, but uh, the I'm always looking for anybody wanting to volunteer in the lab. Um, we have t a laundry list of things that we'd love to be able to do. Um, one of the missions of the lab is outreach and education. And so anybody who would be willing to, hey, I really want to learn this piece of software in an exchange, I'll put together some quick, you know, how-to videos would be fantastic. Um, so pretty much anything. We also have a blog, which uh, sucks because we need content and people to write blog posts. <laughs> Crazy how that works. And uh, so we're always looking for people to help contribute there. If you have your own blog and you want to feed into it, awesome. I'll gladly take it. Um, as long as it's quality. If it's crap, I'll kick you off. But, uh, but yeah, we'd love to, you know, anybody who's able to, wants to learn, uh, wants to dedicate some time, I'll take it. All right. That's how the whole lab got started, all volunteer basis. So. And we appreciate all your guys' hard work. Yeah, likewise. It wouldn't have been possible without customers like you. <laughs> <laughs> all shucks. <Yeah. laughs> so. Oh, okay. <laughs> so. All right. Awesome. Any, anything else? Bueller? Bueller? All right, well then, I have two angry cats to go home and feed. Bye, guys. Bye. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for signing in.